So firstly, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to this Emble EBI training webinar, looking at the Molestar web tool for visualizing 3D molecular structures. My name is James Toltchard, and I'm a data curator here at PDB Europe. Now, in the next few slides, I'll outline the topics the talk will cover, but feel free to ask questions at any time via the Zoom Q&A box. I'm also joined by David Armstrong, another curator here at PDBE, and hopefully between us, we'll be able to answer your questions. Otherwise, you can always ask questions or contact us specifically at PDBE via email or our social media channels. Right, so I'm talking to you today, at least in principle, from the PDB in Europe, based just outside of Cambridge in the UK. We are one of the four sites that comprise the core PDB archive, along with RCSB and the BMRB in America and PDBJ in Japan. And as such, we help to collect, curate, store and disseminate atomic structure information to users all over the world. And we also aim to provide outreach activities to the public and training materials to the scientific community. And this webinar is one such example. Now, here is the outline for the talk today. I'll start off by <clears throat> introducing Molstar and its development before showing you the basic controls and look and feel of Molstar, and then explaining how we can make more advanced selections and create images. We'll then move on to looking at volume data whether it be via EM or X-ray crystallography. And then we'll finish up by looking at ligands and visualizing annotation data from the PDBE entry pages. Okay. To introduce Molstar, I'll assume you're at least familiar with the principle of molecular visualization and are probably aware of a few existing tools already. Perhaps, the most well-known software programs are the desktop-based ones, such as PyMol or Coot. That is the ones which are installed directly on your local computers. And these often have powerful features, such as elements of refinement or docking, but lack full web integration. On the other hand, there are a number of web-based tools, such as JSMol or NGL. And whilst these can be embedded online, they often have very specific functionality. And without the power of local hardware, they can struggle to display larger structures and volume data. Therefore, it was with the idea of resolving these two conflicts that Molstar was developed to provide a molecular viewer that was easy to use and suitable for embedding on time, online content with, but which could also be used to explore aspects which are typically more computationally demanding. This last challenge was tackled from a few directions and as I'll show later, we also host specific data servers, which can be used to serve both coordinate data and volume data in a very precise way. And that way we can be efficient with data transfer, data passing and data uh, processing as possible. Now I'm pleased to say that the Molstar development has been and continues to be a collaborative effort. From the beginning, Molstar has been co-developed between David Senho of PDBE and SciTech and Alex Rose at the RCSB US Protein Data Bank. Then with the scope for site-specific integration, our own Mandar Dash Pandey has also joined the effort with a view to incorporating Molstar into PDBE's online content. In terms of features, Molstar was designed to provide ready access to the most common visualization aspects like representation and coloring, as well as overlays of biological assemblies or validation scores, and for comparing atomic coordinates to their corresponding volume data. This is of course, um, there is of course the ability to pull structures directly from the PDB with an entry succession code, and you can load local structures for visualization as well. There are also many advanced options to dig through such as occlusion and other lighting effects, and thanks to the magic of WebGL, the images you create can be exported in high quality in next to no time without costly operations such as ray tracing. Lastly, it's worth quickly highlighting that I've actually been able to embed Molstar directly into today's presentation 
using an iframe component on the sides.com website. Uh, technically, I, I couldn't find a way to do so with PowerPoint or Google Sides. However, I thought it worth mentioning as it's a really simple process. And in the past, I've spent a lot of time looking at ways of incorporating 3D structural data into my talks. Okay. Now we'll look at the basic usage of Molstar and show you how to load a structure directly from a PDB entry page. First, let's briefly run through the controls. So depending on whether you're using a mouse or a touchscreen device, the controls are as follows. To select and rotate molecules, simply left click and drag or one finger hold and drag. To move or translate a selection, just right click and drag or two finger hold and drag. To zoom in on a selection, either use the scroll wheel or two finger pinch. Two finger scrolling to zoom also works on my laptop trackpad. And for slabbing, <clears throat> either use the scroll wheel with the shift key held down or three finger holding and dragging on a touch device. Okay, so when landing on a typical entry page, you would immediately have a 3D visualization link on the right hand side. Similar links will be available directly from the search pages as well. Now, after clicking this, the Molstar viewer will open as you see here. The main section is showing our molecule or molecules of interest. We then have a tools pane on the right hand side here and a quick access menu to the top right of the main view. In descending order, the icons on the quick access menu allow us to <clears throat> reset the view, take a screenshot, hide the controls pane, expand the viewport, access some advanced rendering options, and at the bottom, we can toggle selection mode as we'll see later. Now the mouse and touch controls I previously mentioned work here in the viewer, and hopefully you can see the speed at which I can easily move around the structure, whether it be by rotating, moving, translating, zooming, or then if I hold shift down, slabbing as well. Now I can use the reset icon to put that back to scratch. Okay, now I just simplify the controls pane a little bit for the first bit. With respect to the typical settings we have for molecular representation, you can find these in the components section on the tools pane. Here, by default, each molecule type uh, will have its own specific options for color and style, and the different components can be individually modified to your preference. If we expand the options associated to the polymer visualization, you can see at the bottom here, the current style is in cartoon representation. If we expand this current representation, we could perhaps change it to another type, um, such as ball and the stick. And after clicking update, we'll have it immediately applied to our polymer selection. As for colors, <clears throat> you can choose from many predefined color themes, which reflect different biophysical or structural parameters. And just quickly as an example, this is how easy it is to change the coloring to, for example, distinguish individual chains. Now, all of these representation options also apply to other components, which is, in this instance, ligands and waters. Um, and lastly, for this section, you might have already spotted something. That is, if you hover, I'll zoom in a little bit, if you hover over a particular region of the structure, you'll get information about that selection shown in the tooltip along the bottom right of the viewer. By default, you can see we're able to quickly get the molecule name, chain, and residue type and number for our selection. And you'll see in other sections of the talk how this information changes depending on the granularity of our selection and whether we're projecting any other annotations onto the structure. Now, following on from the basic controls and representations, I'll now show you the selection tools you can use to help create images with more detailed aspects 
and how we can then download these for use in our work. So to do so, I will jump straight to a structure of a heterodimeric methyl transferase from the SARS-CoV-2 virus with the inhibitor sinifungin bound in the active site. Hopefully, you can already make out the two distinct protein chains here in green and orange, as well as the ligand sinifungin and perhaps a few waters and small molecules as well. Importantly, I minimize these other planes for now. You can also see these definitions here as general classes by default in the components tab on the right, as I showed you before. Now, to start making more interesting selections, we need to toggle on the selection mode from the quick access menu. When active, this makes it possible to make selections with the mouse and also with the new selections toolbar, you can see at the top. To run through the features of the toolbar, the first setting lets us choose the granularity for our selection. So we can distinguish um, atoms, residues or chains, for example. Next, the main four icons allow us to either add, subtract, modify, or create new selections from a wide range of criteria. And the next four allow us then to directly act on these selections, whether it be by quickly applying new styles and colors, creating a new component for our components tab, subtracting an existing selection from our, our components, and then importantly, you also have an undo button on the side here when we make mistakes. Now to show you a few examples uh, of how we can make selections and components, I will first define a new selection for the NSP16 protein, which comprises the active site for this complex. To start off, I will choose the chain level selection and then simply select NSP16 with the mouse. At which point you can see our new selection is colored bright green to show that it's active. However, if I deselect select this by clicking into the background here, I could have also selected NSP16 from the set selection icon, this one here, where it's identifiable by its protein name. Now this might seem trivial for this example, but in more complex structures like ribosomes, this can be really useful for making precise selections. Okay, so now that I have an active selection, I can create a new component directly from the selection bar, giving it a representation and a name. So to do this, I can click on my cube icon here. And in this instance, I can, for example, give it a representation of a surface and under options, give it an appropriate name. By clicking create component, <clears throat> you can see how this now is added as a selection to our components tab. And this can be interacted with as any other selection. Now, another way we can make selections is by manipulating existing ones. For example, if I select the inhibitor now at the residue level, let's go to residue granularity and zoom in a little bit. So if I select the inhibitor, sinifungin, with this active, I can choose to create a new selection based upon the residues which are close in space to my active selection. So to do so again, I can go to the set selection icon, manipulate existing selection, and simply choose surrounding five residues. Sorry, surrounding residues within five angstrom. You can see now that the inhibitor is deselected and our residues close in space have been picked. Now I'll create a new component for this too. Perhaps with ball and stick representation, and we'll give this the name of active site and create. And you can see it added down here again. Now, once created, either by us or with from the default components, we can redefine existing components as well. Now, for example, if I choose the active site component I just created, and rather than going through the selections before, I can simply select this component from the actions menu here. I can now choose to subtract this selection from the NSP16 selection I made earlier. Again, 
by accessing the actions icon. Modify by selection and subtract. Now, whilst it doesn't look like much has happened here, if I now turn on the surface representation again, you can see that we have created quite a clear visualization now of the active site with the ligand. I also now, in fact, might want to just change the color of the active site to clear things up a bit. And let's choose a uniform color or illustrative color just to make that distinction. I'll also deactivate the previous polymer representation. Make that clearer. Now, at this stage, I might also want to pick out some interatomic distances to highlight. To do that between atoms, I should use the atom level granularity. I simply need to choose two atoms. So if we pick two, for example, at the nuclear side end of Sinifungin, which is the closer of the two. There we go. Now, once any two atoms are selected, you can simply choose add from the measurements section and then to create a new distance. There we go. All measurements are defined in this way, and you can choose to change the color and style of the line or indeed the text as you would for representations uh, in the components above. Now, similarly, you can also define labels for, le for selections from the measurements section. So if you set our granularity back to residue, and then choose our residue of interest in this case, as 115. From the add menu for measurements, I can now add a label. And you can see here, this is nicely placed over our selection. Now, to finish up, whilst I might want to polish a few things such as label positioning and color, I ultimately want to download an image of our view for later use. And to do so, I can very simply click on the screenshot icon from the quick access menu. Here, among other things, we could add a transparent background and set uh, perhaps a printer-friendly resolution. And then I can either choose to download it or to test it out directly in a new tab. I hope you can see how, how quick that was to arrive at a fully rendered HD image that's readily downloadable for our use. Okay. And in this section, we will cover how to look at and interpret volume data with Molstar, firstly for X-ray crystallography. With Molstar open, we can find the map options in the, the control pane on the right hand side of the viewer. And this would appear for all X-ray entries. But even without changing any options, just left clicking on the structure will actually bring up the TFO minus FC and FO minus FC emission maps on top of the structure. If you're not familiar with these, simply put the TFO minus FC map should highlight the density into which the model has been built, shown here in blue. And the emission map should highlight any extra density that either wasn't modeled into, shown here in green, or extra bits of model which are not well described by the data, shown here in red. Now, to see this in practice, again, if we navigate from an entry page using the 3D visualization link, once loaded, we can see that by clicking on part of the protein, we automatically, or at least usually, we get a zoomed slabbed view to that residue. And that the relevant selection of a density map has been fetched and overlaid onto the structure. Now, this is an example of Molstar using the PDB volume server. And you should be able to make out that we're only, in fact, looking at a small section of the map. So you can see it here overlaid. And it's just that section we chose. Now, this seems to be quite a nice entry with a typical level of noise in the, in the emit maps here. However, should you want to 
investigate these further, there's also the facility on the right hand side under the volume streaming options to drop the visual thresholds for any of the maps. By clicking on the map names, you can also change the color and representation of the maps as well as their opacity. Lastly, now hopefully this is quick to load. You can also change which sections the map applies to and even visualize the density for the whole asymmetric unit. So if I change our streaming option from a view around focus here to whole structure and click update. Hopefully you can now see we've sourced the whole density map for this entry. So moving on. In this section, I'll show how we can start to analyze EM map data as well. So historically, visualizing EM data has required quite large data transfers. Other tools uh, previously asked you to download uh, map files, for example, to your local machine for use. However, with Molstar, any EM entry with an associated map can be quickly visualized totally online. This firstly takes advantage of the volume server, as I previously mentioned, for the electron density maps. However, we also improve the speed of map visualization for EM data by actively downsampling the maps when using a low zoom level. This way, we can be efficient with the data that we need to serve and process, and the user can appreciate the map data at any level, hopefully without any significant lag. Now, in this example, we will open Molstar directly from a PDB search result. So here you can see I have searched rather crudely for a text search for our uh, PDB code of interest, 6R7M, which is a structure of the tobacco mosaic virus capsid. Now directly from the search result, I can launch Molstar with the 3D visualization link. Now, you can hopefully see how quick a version of the whole map has been loaded and visualized. And this is default behavior for any EM entry. On the right-hand side, we can see the map settings and the volume streaming. For the primary map, we can choose to toggle it very simply on or off. And by clicking on the EM tab, we can also change the color and representation of the map the same way we could for the electron density data. If we look under the actions for view properties, we can also change the detail level, wherein higher detail levels are more resolved. Now, we can clearly make out the additional uh, map volume for which the depositors didn't continue to build structure for, the top and bottom here. Um, and then if we change the view type, for example, to around focus rather than whole structure. Okay, we've removed the map now, but this is now more similar to the behavior for HA crystallography. So if we select specific residue, we get a zoomed um, view to that residue of my selection with just the map served to us that is around that selection. At this level of detail, hopefully you can start to see the density, um, which is helix, for example, has been built into, and also actually put some nice uh, density for the side chains as well. Okay. Here, I will show you how Molstar can be used to show annotations, including those prepared by the PDB and other bioinformatics services. So what I mean by annotations here are, for example, highlighting the differences between the structure in the asymmetric unit versus any biological quaternary structure or symmetry partners. Um, as well, I'd like to think perhaps most of you are familiar with the PDB's validation reports that we produce both during deposition and alongside our entries online. Well, these have a simple color code from green to red that describes the accumulation of geometric issues at the residue specific level. Now this information can be used as a color scheme to help interrogate any entry from the PDB archive. In addition, we can also put in annotations from other services such as PFAM 
to highlight extra features like protein domains. Now to quickly show you those features, we now have a structure of HSP90 with an inhibitor. At the top of the control pane, under type, you can see what we're looking at is the biological assembly in our selection. And that what we can see is two distinct, hopefully you can see two distinct polymer chains. However, if I choose to only show the model in the deposited file, we can see that the dimer we saw previously is actually built with a symmetry operation and that the deposited coordinates in the asymmetric unit only describe this monomer. Now, if I go back up to annotations, I can choose to show the validation report, which we can see, perhaps unsurprisingly, that our most dynamic regions are our worst performing. If we then hover over specific residues, we're also able to see a bit more detail about the annotations in the tooltip. And here we can see that uh, AS156 has validation issues with RSRZ outliers, bad bond lengths, and planarity. Okay, so if I turn that off for the validation report, here is where I can choose to show annotations from external services. PFAM, actually, I'll drop this down a little bit. PFAM, for example, uh, with this selection now, is highlighting the histidine kinase domain. You can see in orange. Um, Interpo option highlights the different subdivisions of functional families in HSP90. And the CAF structural annotation describes the whole heat shock protein 90 topology. Okay, so moving on from annotations, here I'd like to show how Molstar can be a great way to investigate ligands in specific PDB entries. For example, when on an entry page where ligands are present, specific links will be available next to each chemical comp component present in the entry. When these are clicked, we are taken to the bound molecule page. Here we'll be presented firstly with a 2D view of the ligand with descriptions of the neighboring protein residues and an instance of Molstar showing the exact ligand in 3D on the right hand side. If multiple instances of the same ligand are present, these can be zoomed to specifically by using the drop down box towards the top of the page. Now, in this instance of Molstar, to save space on the page, the right-hand control pane is hidden by default. However, by toggling the expanded view from the quick access menu, right from this page, we can maximize the viewer to take a closer look. And from here, we can also then show our controls if we need to. And lastly, for edge entries like this one, you can see that by default, the 2FO minus FC and the mission maps are shown in Molstar, and this is to help you readily inspect the ligands for any given entry. Now, in the last section of the talk, I'll describe how Molstar works with other components of the PDBE website to help show correlations between sequence and structure data. So, from an entry page, you can choose to investigate macromolecular entities via the molecule details link. This can be found towards the middle of the entry page on the left hand side. Now on this page we can see a linear description of our protein chain from N to C terminus and how different elements such as the uniprop sequence or PFAM domains align to the deposited sequence. Calculated features such as validation metrics and secondary structure are also shown. Now further down, we can also see a 2D structure diagram for our entry and another instance of Molstar. Now these three panes are actually all tied together behind the scenes. And if we hover over any one feature, 
you can start to visually correlate data in multiple representations to interrogate the system. Now, if I scroll up a little bit here, I can, for example, choose a residue on our, our validation report. And when clicking it, I'll get a zoomed 3D interface in the multi-star window, highlighting that particular residue. Now, this instance of Molestar is very similar to the previous version on the Ligands page, and it's a customized view. And again, if I click on the full screen icon, I'll maximize the window. Now, if I reset the view, to finish, I'd like to just show how different models within a given entry, um, for example, this solid state NMR entry here, can be visualized with a selector in the main viewer. And this option at the top here, will be shown whenever multiple models are available for entry. And hopefully you'll agree that the controls are quite intuitive and straightforward and allow you to traverse all the models within the ensemble. Okay, so this is the end of the talk. Thank you for staying to the end, if you're still with us. And in conclusion, I hope I've been able to show that Molestar is a fast and simple online molecular viewer with powerful tools for analyzing complex structures. By drawing upon the coordinated links that the PDB maintain, I hope you can see how Molestar has the potential to readily allow the comparison of structural models to their associated data, and that it does so efficiently with particular regard to the visualization of volume maps. Okay, all right then. So if anyone has any questions, myself and David will be happy to answer them. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, James. And thank you all for listening to, to the webinars uh, today. Uh, so there are a couple of questions, um, James. So one anonymous question came uh, while you were in your ligand section of your uh, talk. Okay. Um, that? So that I think I think that has been answered by. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so that was a question about uh, the ligand section. What What do you mean by bad behavior in yellow red? I think that was the question, if I remember correctly. Uh, so the yellow and red will most likely be the color scheme for the uh, overlay of validation data. So you'll see here. So Oh, yeah. It doesn't, to be fair, it doesn't explicitly say it in the Molestar viewer, but it follows from our actual PDF reports that you get with um, deposition or on our entry pages. And explained in the PDF is the color scheme, um, wherein residues which have perfect validation metrics are colored green. And this increments with one um, uh, structural error in yellow, two in orange and three or more in red, whether that be bond lengths, bad outliers, Ramachandran outliers, RSRZ outliers. Um, yeah. So, okay. so we another question from, from Jan. What is the best way to share your visual, visualizations, scenes, states uh, with, with a colleague who might not be a structural biologist? Sure. Um, so for the time being, uh, let me just, uh, where are we? Come out of full screen. So uh, on the with the Molestar um, viewer as implemented on um, PDB partner websites, as far as I'm aware, you're you're not able to share states with colleagues in that way. However, um, there is a, a raw version of Molestar available at molestar.org. Um, which implements all features of Molestar, not, not um, highly uh, refined versions that you can find on our pages. And here, I believe you can define, if you can't define states already, then it will be a, a feature that's coming soon, um, wherein you could create a URL with your, with your view and send that amongst colleagues. Dave uh, might correct me if I'm wrong there. Yes, so um, so once you've actually, so if you actually click apply on that example of download structure. Uh, this one? Yeah. 
it will open the structure and there are uh, there should then be there are states options i think on one of the tabs on the very left hand side the save icon so there is a an experimental feature here for states and session saving um, at the moment you can kind of save these sessions to the molstar server itself temporarily but obviously when they build up those will get removed and there is the option to take those sessions and save them so that they can be reloaded but as it says there that's a um, experimental feature so it's not something which is necessarily as as well supported right now as for example pymol sessions but definitely i think it's something that will be worked on in the future Thank you, David. Uh, we have a question from Lucy. Uh, can it be used to visualize MD simulations? So I think uh, on one of our entry pages for NMR, it allows you to view an NMR ensemble as a trajectory. So with that terminology, perhaps that's a bit misleading. Um, through the instances through our website, you cannot upload data to it. It's reading data from our archive. Um, again, with this raw Molstar version, um, there is a functionality to load, upload files from your machine. I am unsure if you can load trajectories. Um, where would that be? Under URL, Dave. Yes, so I, I, I believe if you have a file with um, the trajectory defined as multi-models, and load it in, it will load them as, as a multi-state um, type of view. So it's able to it's able to do to handle those types of things. Um, obviously, we're predominantly presenting today what we have on the PDVE pages, and at the moment we're only showing data that's in PDVE entries. So you know, in that case, no molecular um, dynamics visualizations, but there is the possibility to do this through the Molstar viewer. And I think if, you, if you're not sure about how to do that, or you have any more questions, you can obviously contact the developers directly um, through the molstar.org website. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, now we have another question. Is it possible to visualize the full chain sequences within Molstar and select it as in PyMol? If by that you mean the, um, the representation of the sequence, then not through PDB pages. So uh, what you can see here um, as the raw version of Molstar, the full version, you can, you can indeed select between um, different molecules. Actually, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get a sequence for that, but for cytochrome here, you, you can see how switching between them shows you the, the relevant sequence. We currently do not support that with PDBE, but I think on the RCSB um, site, they do allow that. Let's do another one. That'll do. Um, and where are PDBE? Yes, so you can see the sequence through their implementation. and make specific selections there. That's really good. Uh, we have another question. How it is different from Maestro or Scrodingu? Um, I'm not familiar with, with Maestro um, or Schrodinger, <laughs> actually, in practice. <laughs> Dave, do you have any uh, insight there? I have a very surface knowledge of Schrodinger, um, which I believe is a full kind of suite of of software to to analyze ligand interactions and things like that for molecular structures. But as far as I'm aware, um, that is a desktop installed software. But I'm not 100 percent sure about that. But but they are different software. Molstar is very much a visualization tool predominantly and it's browser based and hopefully fast and and kind of 
quick to get those visualizations. So they, there are obviously lots of different types of viewers that you can use to get structural visualizations. Um, but this is obviously the one that, that we use through and, and RCSB as well use for PDB structures. All right, so another question on Mozstar, is it a web only software or is there an offline uh, or desktop version that can be downloaded? So the short answer is no, there is not. Um, so the, the kind of one of the, the um, fundamental points about Mozstar is, is it to be a, a web um, integrated viewer. So from a user perspective, it will be, um, accessible only through a browser. But that being said, all the code from Allstar, if you're uh, development minded, is available for download through their GitHub page. And you could easily set up your own instance of Allstar, should you wish. There's even um, uh, a well-defined documented um, query language, which would allow you to, to transfer um, scripts and uh, representations from existing online viewers like NGL. Um, into Molstar as well, should you want to do that. All right. Uh, is it possible to use scripts for complex or repetitive visualizations? <laughs> so personally, I have not done that. I think that um, the underlying code, if, if again, if you're development minded at present, can be... Um, can be used so that, you know, for example, what defines the difference in an implementation between RCSB and Molstar.org or PDBE can be instantiated with in a, in a script-like way. That currently isn't a standard user feature um, and I have no further <laughs> understanding of that, I'm sorry. All right. Uh... We have another uh, question. I have not solved any structure through NMR, but heard that PyMol is used when solving structure. Are the PyMol and Molstar similar? Um, so having solved NMR structures, I can say that whilst PyMol is useful in the analysis of your ensembles and your, um, your structure and with some plugins allows you to compare your restraints to the structure. It isn't inherently tied to the refinement process or the model building process. Um, and so I would say in essence, it is as good as PyMol in, in viewing your, your, your refined your calculated structures especially at the moment with Molstar.org where you can upload your own models and ensembles to look at. However, you won't get any of the refinements. So not, I don't think there's any refinement possibilities of, with PyMol, but things like Yazara or, or other software, VMD as well, will allow you to um, analyze certain structural qualities of your model and you won't get that in Molstar currently. So yes and no. All right, uh, thanks. We have another question uh, that, that I understand Molstar is the heir of LightMol and NGL. Could you highlight what Molstar does that these two previous two uh, do not? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, I might need to draw on Dave for an answer to this one. Well, I, I suppose the the fact is that the developers of LightMol and NGL worked together to create Molstar. So, <laughs> so in a way, it's kind of the best of both worlds. So although it may be that there are some new features that have been added through Molstar, um, especially not necessarily so many of the things on our website version, but some of the things available through the molstar.org website and also the underlying um, MolQL language having a dedicated molecular query language for the viewer, I don't think was something that was available before. So yeah, it's, there's not huge amounts of brand new things, but I think the one of the big strengths of NGL was the visualizations and how, how 
good looking essentially the viewer was um and light mole the beneficial thing was some of these coordinate servers behind the scenes that sped up things and made it much easier to just view the most important things that you wanted to see and i think what Molestar has done is brought those two things together. So hopefully you get the best of both those viewers. You get these fantastic visualizations with the kind of speed and, and ease of implementation that Molestar, that Lightmore had as well. Thanks, David. So now we have a question from, I think, a developer point of view from Nuria. So first of all, Nuria uh, loved the, the mold star and uh, she says nice work. Uh, but she says, I would like to integrate it in a platform I will create. I'm not a software developer yet. So I would like to know uh, if you are planning to give a similar workshop, but from the developer point of view and how to integrate it in other platforms, how to make default representations without the user doing anything. Good question. So. Uh, as far as I'm aware, we don't currently have any um, webinars that are publicly accessible, and we don't have we haven't planned to do any. But if there's enough interest to do that, then perhaps that's something we could look into. So one thing one thing we did hold um, last year was a an API webinar series. Mm, yeah. Um, so one of those um, one of those was focused on data visualization, um, not specifically on Milestar, but more generally around our library of components that can be embedded in your website and used by others. So um, I will just put the, I'll put the link for that in the, if I can find that question, I'll put the link in that to the reply in that question. Um, and uh, yeah, then you can, you can try that out. So that's, it's on our PDBE training pages. There's a link to, to our API webinar series. And it was also done through EBI training as well. So if you visit EBI's training pages, uh, you'll be able to access all those webinars from there. Great. Uh, so now we have no um, more open questions. So thank you. Thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. And thank you, James, for a wonderful presentation. And thanks, David, for answering uh, some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.